records here. On this edition of Native Report, we meet artist Ben Pease and view his works of art that combined iconic celebrity images with Crow influences. I've kind of appropriated Native American uh, regalias with the uh, white weasel ermine skins here. We learned about the historical significance of the buffalo for the Crow Nation in Montana. And we interview Crow Nation Senator Rudolph Knut, um, Old Crow Senior. As a nation, as you know, that's probably why I'm wearing a hat. We're very horse oriented. We also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Ben Pease is an up-and-coming artist from the Crow Nation in Montana. What makes his artwork stand out is his use of iconic celebrity images adorned in traditional Crow clothing, giving the image a whole new meaning. In the shade of a tree near Custer Creek, Ben Pease unloads gear and several pieces of his artwork. On this morning, he'll paint what he calls a quick draw. So something just real fast and loose. I mean, it's not going to be perfect right now, but if I spend maybe 20 minutes or so, it'll look pretty realistic. You know, I don't try to, you know, focus in on the small details right away. I just kind of try to squint my eyes and see what looks correct and what doesn't look so correct. And so I'm just painting by instinct right now and uh, it's nothing real scientific but it comes out looking all right to my eye anyways well i've been doing art for say almost four years now and uh lately i've been working on um you know chronicling the, the native american uh how would i say the native american um journey you know, in contemporary society, in mainstream society, I mean, European society. So, um, so I've been trying to uh, depict them in a more societal state. For example, I did a, a recent piece, I called it uh, Ultimate Warriors. And I depicted four uh, traditional, it was a, a traditional photograph from the 18, 1890s maybe. And it was of four traditional crow foot racers and they had a breech cloth and uh, they were barefoot. They didn't have any moccasins on, so it must have been a short, shorter race. And so I've, I've taken that image and I've appropriated it into um, adding Nikes on their feet, Nike uh, running shoes. I've kind of mixed the, uh, the, the old with the new in this one, uh, juxtaposition. Ben works with acrylics, oils, and charcoal on a variety of papers in addition to traditional canvases. He also does mixed-media collages. All of his artwork honors his Crow and Cheyenne ancestry. I'll do oil paints or acrylic paints or graphite or charcoal or um, collage with uh, actually the actual antique ledger paper, vintage ledger papers uh, on canvas usually. And so it's, it's kind of a medley, I suppose. And I think it brings a lot of different um, subtleties into my work. So say the, the ledger papers from 1908 and some particular event happened in 1908 and so I, can, can, I could uh, contextually con connect that with the art I'm doing or portraying. And then the paints, you know, acrylics or oils, you know, people are kind of on the fence about those, but you know, I like to work with them in different ways, you know, because they bring their own strengths in certain parts. And then graphites, you know, the darks, the lights, um, pen, you know, to, straight darks lines and things like that and so I'm always trying something new basically it's all experimentation you know I'll be walking down the street and I'll see you know like a feather you know on a window and like a stereotypical Native American man wearing a headdress and maybe that'll inspire me to do 
or more a socio-political piece. Or I'll see, like walking through the halls of the tribal building here in Crow Agency, I'll see um, a, one of our uh, tribal elders and I'll, I'll have some motivation, de determination to depict that person. And, uh, or like in the mainstream news, I'll see some issues happening there or I'll notice some issues on the reservation and I'll, I'll go after those. Some of Ben's most striking works are contemporary iconic images that contain Crow and Cheyenne cultural influences. John Lennon sports white weasel ermine skins and Audrey Hepburn's black cocktail dress is adorned with traditional cowrie shells. So John Lennon here, he's part of the series Words Are Your Weapons, as is Audrey Hepburn over here, if you got that shot. Um, people who I've depicted in the series Words Are Your Weapons are people who were, you know, better people than society made them out to be, you know. A lot of people called John Lennon a rebel, but there's times where he stood up for Native Americans when nobody else would. You know, I think one of, one of his quotes, he was on a nightly show and he said, uh, and he was speaking of natives and their land and their cultures and their traditions. If you don't let them practice this, um, either, either give it to them or die, I guess, is basically what he said. When he was around, he, you know, he, he was a good man, you know, he, he stood for a lot more. So um, this is a mixed media piece, as you can tell. This is on canvas. Um, background, it's a, it's a bunch of different layering, so it's background acrylic. Um, the actual um, records here, and the um, it's from a vintage poster, is the image of John Lennon here, and I think his t-shirt said New York. Um, and I've, I've kind of appropriated Native American uh, regalias with the uh, white weasel ermine skins here. Each one of these denotes a war deed in the Crow way. You know, steal, stealing an enemy's horse, striking an enemy to count coup, um, to lead a successful war party into battle and back, and uh, to um, steal an enemy's weapon. I think. And also I've added the um, Indian power um, buttons here along with the American Indian movement um, patch. Just kind of immortalizing John Lennon for, for his deeds. Audrey Hepburn. Most people uh, throughout time have known her for just being you know, a beautiful person, you know, one of the most beautiful celebrities. Well, I know her as, you know, being a uh, really positive role model and figure in the humanitarian societies. She's always helped people in need. I've kind of leaned more towards um, my art being more educational for the people and for its viewers, fighting against stereotypical terms or, you know, racial slurs. I try to hold on to the culture also through my artwork. Here's what you should know about diabetes. Diabetes is a problem with your body that causes blood sugar levels to rise higher than normal. This is called hyperglycemia. The pancreas makes insulin and insulin helps sugar get into your cells to be used as fuel. Diabetes type 1 is usually diagnosed in children and young adults and was previously known as juvenile diabetes. The pancreas does not make any insulin in diabetes type 1 and insulin injections have to be given. Gestational diabetes is diabetes during pregnancy. Women who get this may not have had diabetes at the beginning of pregnancy and might not have it after they deliver. Diabetes type 2 is the most common form of diabetes. Diabetes type 2 is a problem with insulin working properly. This is called insulin resistance. At first, the pancreas can make enough insulin to keep blood sugars in control, but eventually it can't keep up and blood sugars rise. When glucose builds up in the blood instead of going into the cells, the cells can be starved for energy and this causes fatigue. Over time, high glucose levels can hurt your eyes, your kidneys, heart, and nerves. The first treatment for diabetes type 2 is always changes in diet and exercise. Sometimes, if blood sugars are really high, medications or insulin injections are started early on. Complications of untreated diabetes include kidney disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, strokes, and nerve damage. The combination of high blood sugars and high blood pressure damages kidneys. As this happens, the kidneys allow proteins to pass, and these can be detected by urine tests. Controlling blood glucose and blood pressure and using medicines called ACE inhibitors can prevent kidney problems. Heart disease is another complication of diabetes. Diabetes hurts both small and large blood vessels, and the blood supply to the heart muscle itself can be affected. This can lead to shortness of breath, 
heart failure, and heart attacks. High blood glucose can also cause damage to the blood vessels in the brain. If a blood vessel gets plugged up or breaks, the part of the brain it supplies cannot get oxygen and that part dies. This is called a stroke. High blood glucose damages nerves and people with diabetes can get tingling or burning pain called neuropathy in their feet. The nerves and blood vessels going to the feet are very long and damage to them can cause foot sores or ulcers that can be very difficult to heal. Nerve and blood vessel damage can also happen in the eyes. Diabetes is a leading cause of blindness in the U.S. Nerve damage in the digestive system can cause a problem called diabetic gastroparesis, where the movement of food is slowed or stopped. All of these problems can be prevented by taking care of your diabetes. This means frequent clinic visits, routine blood sugar testing, exercising, stopping non-ceremonial tobacco use, taking medicines as prescribed, and maintaining a sensible diet. Diabetes can be controlled and complications avoided. I'm Dr. Arnie Wainio and your health matters. Near Crow Agency, Montana, the buffalo roam the Bighorn Mountains like they did generations ago. The herd is closely managed by the nation's Fish and Game Division to ensure the resources there for future generations. The sun is at its midday peak and this small herd of buffalo, also known as the American bison, grazes in the pasture. The Crow Nation Fish and Game Department rounded up this group from a larger herd in the Bighorn Mountains. The ones behind us, uh, these we took these down uh, last September from the herd in the mountain and the intent is to um, sell them and process the meat and kind of generate revenue off of uh, the meat. It's kind of a little bit higher than beef around here. We got about 2,000 head up in the Bighorn Mountains. Uh, tribal members can hunt them for free. Uh, they use it for feeds, for cultural reasons. Uh, maybe they need a robe for some. Uh, there's different various aspects in our culture you can use them for. And uh, we also sell hunts. Uh, we sell about maybe 20 to 30 hunts a year to generate revenue for the fish and game, uh, and we actually uh, promote that. It's actually a pretty good deal, so we, we maintain the herd, we guide them, and then we, we also enforce the game codes on the reservation. So. Well, we got about 20 guys on staff. Uh, we cover 2.2 million acres, uh, the entire reservation. We gotta be out there every day, year round. Uh, we got people hunting. There's, there's no seasons for the crows. So they're out there all the time hunting and um, we just gotta maintain a, a presence out there. And uh, it gets pretty tough. We probably need like 50 guys. So that's why we're trying to generate revenue off the bison. At one time, the bison numbered in the millions across the plains and were hunted nearly to extinction. Today, even though herd numbers are smaller, the significance of the bison to the Crow Nation is as great as it was hundreds or even thousands of years ago. At one point, uh, it was kind of meant everything to the crow. I mean, we got all our clothing and uh, teepees and food and uh, followed the herds uh, with the horses and uh, they kind of meant everything. And uh, a lot of tribes were the same way, but uh, in the modern era, I guess, uh, they've lost touch with the buffalo, the bison, and uh, we still kind of have a, a good grip with, uh, with the bison. Back in the day, they were in the hundreds of millions. If we sat here and we were on a herd right now, it, was, it would probably stretch uh, as, as far as you can see. And they would just, when they roll through, they just plow up the ground and they just leave a big old path. And it's just, I mean, I, I can't even imagine that. My uncles used to used to go and take one every year, and they'd bring me along, and we'd you know we'd go on the hunt, and we just kind of I guess took it for granted that it was kind of a normal thing. You don't realize until you start growing up that not everyone gets to uh, experience what we experience here, and it, again it kind of makes you proud to be part of the Crow tribe. There's a connection not only with, with myself, I'll, I see it with tribal members. Uh, they don't usually come out and hunt it a lot. But when they do, they kind of feel a connection and they, kind of a sense of pride that we can still do 
do what we did, you know, 100 years ago and still keep our ways. And uh, we use the, the whole buffalo. Uh, we don't waste anything. By the time we're done, uh, when a tribal member is hunting, there's probably just like a spinal cord left. They pretty much take everything. The Crow Nation Game and Fish Department do harvest the bison for ceremonial purposes. The department also oversees other game management practices, ensuring the natural resources, such as the bison, are there for future generations. Last week, uh, they wanted uh, two buffalo taken for a feed, uh, and they wanted it done with a bow, uh, because if we use the rifle, they would just break through the fence. And it's a little, little different here on the mountain. You got timber and brush and, and stuff to take cover and sneak up on them, but we kind of had to um, they seen us coming, so it was kind of a standoff and it was really stressful and uh, we had someone with a bow and we had two backup shooters just in case and they were pretty angry. That's, I mean, they're as wild as can be. You can't approach them, they'll charge you. It's pretty dangerous. We also do enforcement, uh, obviously. We got to enforce the game code. People like to violate the law, they like to take shortcuts and we also have a little focus on conservation. Uh, this year we just started a huge conservation effort. We're mapping all the sage grouse. I guess they're trying to uh, put them on the endangered species list. So we're trying to locate all the, the breeding sites and nesting grounds. And we documented that and we also, uh, we're actually starting another program with the black-footed ferret. Uh, and they, uh, they live off prairie dogs and they're pretty much uh, wiped out around here. It's pretty much extinct in the wild. So uh, in September, I think we're going to get 30. And we got a place uh, a little west of here where we're going to introduce them and try to maintain them and hopefully they uh, take a foothold and come back. So just being in the mountains, uh, especially the bighorns, there's like a certain smell like in July, like the, the green and the, the plants and stuff up there. You kind of when it's a long winter, you, you miss that stuff. And I just like being outdoors. I like to take my kids along and show them what they showed me and stuff. I'll pass it along and keep it alive. Being native is a beautiful understanding of life, <laughs> you know, and to understand it, you know, it's a, a huge gift. It's a huge gift. We just have to realize those things are right in front of us. They're right there in your life. You just have to see it. You know? And I think part of our commitment to that is to show you how to get there, whether it's through sun dancers or sweat lodges, you know, adoption ceremonies. Uh, the making of relatives, the more relatives you make, the better. Because you get to share that same message with people. And your, your, your community gets huger. It gets huge. You know? And so now you have 40, 50 people than just yourself, but they all understand the same thing. You know? Native is a beautiful thing. <laughs> you, know, you truly are connected to the Creator. Did you know that the Crow Nation has its own legislature? Prior to 2001, the nation had what is described as a townhouse council, where every eligible voter was a council member. But it was decided to develop a new constitution to help lead the nation into a new century. As people go about their business in Crow Agency, Montana, the Speaker of the House for the Crow Legislature is inside the Chamber offices preparing for a community meeting. We meet quarterly uh, at, at each session or if there's urgent business that needs to be done we have special sessions during the interim and during the interim we, we have our committee meetings. We have seven standing committees. Uh, these committees meet on the uh, issues that are either in uh, in committee that, that were introduced, that were adopted into the body, but 
decided, you know, this needs to go to committee to understand it better or maybe make some amendments to that issue or law. Uh, during the weekdays, uh, we have committee meetings. And not only that, we, we meet with the executive. Uh, the chairman would come over or one of his uh, cabinet heads or directors would come over and meet on different issues that need to be uh, addressed. There are six districts. Uh, there's the Center Lodge, Valley of the Chiefs, Mighty Few District, the Reno District or Center Lodge District, Black Lodge District, uh, Bighorn District, and then the um, Arrow Creek District. There are 18 of us, uh, three representatives from each district, and we run on staggered terms. In fact, this year, uh, one from each district is up for election this year. And two years from now, there would be 12 up for election, uh, uh, two from each district, uh, running the staggered term, so that way there's continuity. The Crow Nation Constitution and bylaws were adopted in 1948, but were repealed and replaced with the 2001 Constitution and bylaws of the Crow Tribe of Indians that established the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. Back in 2001, the Crow tribe decided uh, um, to change the constitution because uh, the constitution that we functioned with before was developed back in 1948 uh, and it was more of a, a townhouse council where every eligible voter was a member of the council. It seemed, uh, well I guess that's my opinion, that nothing was being accomplished. Uh, there was no continuity. Every two years there was a either a new chairman or the current chairman would have to struggle and uh, fight to maintain his seat. Just 14 years ago, the tribe decided to develop a new constitution, which was, is similar with the federal uh, constitution. You have your three branches of government. You have your executive, your legislature, and your judicial. And that was the way our new constitution uh, is formatted. We're still at the infancy stage, as you know, we we're only 14 years old, uh, but we're, I believe, making progress, developing uh, many codes and laws uh, as a foundation for our, our nation. Being speaker, um, we have an election every January, uh, and out of the members here, um, we elect who the speaker would be. And we also have a secretary of the house. We elect who the secretary of the house would be. And then of course we would have, uh, since we have the seven standing committees, we have elections for the chairs of each of those committees also. Senator Old Crow's great-grandfather was also a tribal leader. And the senator is acutely aware of the responsibilities he must uphold for the benefit of the Crow Nation. Old Crow was uh, na the name of my great-grandfather. He was one of the chiefs. Uh, of the Crow Nation back in the late 1800s. He was um, one of the war chiefs for at the Battle of Rosebud, and he was among some of the delegations that went to uh, Washington, D.C. There was one in, uh, I believe in 1868, he was in a treaty delegation that went to D.C., and another one in uh, 82. Um, take a little pride in it. But yet also with that comes the responsibility to uphold that name, uh, making sure that I'm not going to disgrace that name. I have to uh, set myself at a higher standard, I guess. And one of the reasons that, we, that our tribe, I believe, is very successful in maintaining our culture is through our clan system. It's matrilineal. Uh, you belong to the clan of your mother, and you're a child of your father's clan. Uh, those are the, the people I would go for, to for prayer and for advice. We're just a nation like any other Native American nation. We have our systems that are probably very similar with yours or any other nation. We have our clan systems. Uh, we have our language. We have our land base, uh, which, which makes us a nation, is our land base. Without our land base, we wouldn't be a nation. One of the challenges might be the unemployment rate. Unemployment rates are high, so therefore kids start, young people start getting into trouble because of boredom, maybe, or depression, start getting into drugs and alcohol. 
start losing hope. So we here have a big challenge as a government to um, make something happen for them so that way there is hope for them, that there is something out there that we can give them an opportunity to, to advance in, in, in the dominant society. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Join us next week for another Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>